Good morning, Trinity Christian Fellowship. Big thank you to everyone out here in the parking lot today. It's great to see you. If you happen to be listening in on the airwaves over FM 103.1 KTCF, at least for the next hour or so. And uh, also just a big welcome to any of you that might be joining us later when we post this online on YouTube. It's great to have you with us, however you're, you're joining us today. The goal remains the same. We're going to lift up the name of our Lord Jesus in worship. We're going to have a communion devotion given by our brother Mike Langham. And then we're going to learn uh, from his word through the sermon of our pastor Al. So I invite everyone to bow their heads with me in a word of prayer, and then we'll get started in a time of worship. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you so much for the rain. Uh, that's coming later today. God, thank you for holding that off a little bit so we can do our service this morning. One way or the other, Lord, we're going to be worshiping you. That's what we came here this morning to do. That's why we've tuned in on the airwaves or pulled up the video on YouTube, God. We want to give you glory this morning. We want to acknowledge who you are, that you are God. We want to acknowledge your sacrifice, the forgiveness you offer through your death on the cross, Lord. I want to acknowledge your resurrection, that you physically resurrected and ascended into heaven, and that through that we have hope of eternity with you, Lord. Thank you, God, for all these sacrifices and for your glory and for your love that you show to us on a daily basis by bestowing your Holy Spirit upon us. Lord, this is our response to you this morning. May all the glory from our voices, our instruments, our thoughts, our speech, and our actions today, may it all go to glorifying you. Thank you so much, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Sing our first song here, which is a beautiful one. Yes. 
makes us ask the question, what can we do for you? What can we possibly give back in light of what you've given for us?
have Brother Mike come forward and give us a communion devotion this morning. Good morning. I want to read from uh, Matthew chapter 18, starting at verse 1. It says, At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? I read this and I'm thinking, wow, the apostles had a lot of gall to ask Jesus who was the best. Could you imagine us doing that? You ever, ever pray that, God? Who's the best in the kingdom? Never. You know, it's all about, God, thank you for what you've done. Thank you that I can at least get to go to heaven because of you. But then he, you know, he, he, then he says, he called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, Jesus said, truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like Little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever, become, whoever welcomes one, one such child in my name welcomes me. You know, I don't know about you, but when I, when I, when I hear that, Jesus said, be like a child. I can do that. You know, I can I can be like a child. Just, you know, children aren't, he's not talking about innocence. That's kind of, you know, innocent is, uh, well, none of us are innocent. We know that. And none of us are sinless. But like a child, you know, we were humble. Children are humble. Children are, you know, just loving. I'm, my wife, when she goes to see the kids, my grandkids. She goes and visits them. She's like on cloud nine. I can tell. She can be, she can feel as bad as ever, but she's just on cloud nine with my, my grandkids. It's just something that, you know, kids do for us, right? They just make us smile. Because why? Because they are always smiling. You know, they're always, they always want what's best. And they're just, they're just humble little, little, Little people. I'm, talking, I'm not talking about teenagers. I'm talking about, you know, youngsters. Um, but Jesus says we need to be like that. Simple. We need to be simple like a child. You know, salvation is easy to be like a child. Trust in Christ and just be like a child. Man, and to me it's just like it lets our shoulders down, you know. Yeah, you mean, you mean I don't got to do this? I don't got to do that? It's not about what I do. It's just being like a child? Wow, I could do that. I can do that, Jesus. Thank you. Amen? Father, I thank you, Lord, that salvation, heaven is easy with your son, Jesus. Lord, he paid it all. He paid for our sins. He paid for... Um, Everything we've done, Lord, help us to remember that, Lord, that you just want us to be simple folk. Lord, easy folk. God, you know, not not people who struggle with um, anxiety. God, you just want us to trust in you like a child trusts in their parents, like a child knows their parents are going to help them, take care of them. Lord, that's all you want. You want us to know that you're our parent and you're going to take care of us. Simple as a, as a child. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you for that devotion, Mike. And now if you do have elements of communion, bread, wine, or juice, feel free to take them now. And we're going to sing the last song here, which is uh, I Am Not Alone. Just a great thing to to remember that no matter what's happening we're not alone
through deep waters. When I walk through deep waters, I know that you will be with me. When I'm standing in the fire, I will not be overcome. Through the valley of the shadow, I will not fear. I am not alone. I am not alone. You will go before me. You will never leave me. I am not alone. I am not alone. You will go before me. You will never leave me in the midst of deep sorrow. In the midst of deep sorrow, I see your light is breaking through. Dark of night will not overtake me. I am pressing into you. Lord, you fight my every battle, and I will not fear. I am not alone. I am not alone. You will go before me. You will never leave me. I am not alone. I am not alone. You will go before me. You will never leave me. You amaze me. You amaze me. You deem me. Call me as your own. You amaze me, redeem me. You call me as your own. You amaze me, redeem me. You call me as your own. You amaze me, redeem me. You call me as your own. You're my strength. in the storm Through these trials you've always been faithful You bring healing to my soul I am not alone I am not alone You will go before Good morning, Trinity Christian Fellowship. Oh, I can take this off up here. It is good to be together. I love you, and uh, you love me, but this is not the Barney show. That's how they would always start that. God bless Barney. It was the one way in which uh, sometimes my wife could actually uh, get things done while the kids were immobile in front of the TV. 
But here we come together to be animated by the Word of God. And we love Him, and God is good and holy, and He draws us together in a world that tends to tear people apart and pit one against the other. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Great God in heaven, holy is your name, and we thank you that you've brought us here together from our different places to be together in love with you, in love with one another, and rejoicing in the blessings that you have given to us. We are truly grateful. Like Phil said, we're grateful for the rain that's coming later on today. Lord, we're grateful for the strides ahead going on with COVID, but Lord, we're also kind of concerned places like Brazil and Italy that are having huge steps backward. So, Lord, I pray you'd help them in their time of need, and Lord, help us to be able to manage our times of need that might be surging in the future. We don't know, Lord, but we trust it into your hands. Help us always to be people who are friends, and people who love, and people who, of prayer, praying as Jesus taught us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Turning your Bibles to the book of John, chapter 15. John 15, starting with verse 9. This is a section I call being of sound body and mind, a phrase you might receive or see in a last will and testament. Jesus is being able to give his last words that are without duress. He's going to have further words in Gethsemane when his soul is just being tormented by the emotions of the time. Later on, when he's in trials and being beaten and then crucified, he'll have more words. But these ones are not under duress. He's able to talk calmly with his disciples, and he is very clear on what he wants. He's very clear on what's ahead. And I always kind of wonder when it comes my time what my last words might be. And I sure hope it's not going to be something dumb. Uh, in many respects, I kind of dread my final words might be, how do you work this remote? Or can I have more pudding? Or something like that. And we look for something significant. I might actually make something cryptic like in Citizen Kane where he says rosebud and that's what the whole thing comes about and drives everybody crazy. Jesus knows exactly what he wants and he has some things that he's sharing and it transforms the Apostle John. In John 15, he devotes, or remember last week we talked about Matthew and how Tuesday evening was very, or Tuesday of the day was very important to Matthew because it was a time of warning for the Israelite people. And Matthew was writing to the Israelites and he gave five chapters out of 28 to that one day. Well, in this day, on Monday, Thursday, the Last Supper day, the Apostle John gives five chapters out of 21 chapters to that one evening. That's significant. Almost one-fourth of the gospel for one evening. Because it made a huge difference to him. You see, it says in chapter 13 of John, where John was sitting, he was sitting right next to Jesus, leaning up against Jesus. And so he could hear all of Jesus' words. Well, everybody could hear his words. But there, when you're right next to a person, you can see if they're sighing, if they're rolling their eyes, if they're grinding their teeth, if they're nervous, or whatever it might be. And it made a huge impression on John because he went from being what was called one of the sons of thunder. He was a hothead. He was also one of the guys, along with his brother James, to see if they could get special positions in the kingdom of God. Be, who, who can have, be to the right and left? Who can be the greatest, right? And everybody else hated him. He went from that to becoming known as the apostle of love. And then he goes on to write the, uh, the um, epistle of 1 John, which is all about love. It's incredible. But it made a huge impression on him. Let's read just those few verses right from the middle of those five chapters which I think is actually the main apex of the evening. Starting with verse 9 from John 15, it says this, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you 
and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay one's life down for your friends. In this, there are three things I kind of focus on. The first is Jesus' last wish. What's his last wish? For us to love one another as he has loved us. In the Old Testament, 600 plus commands. We, those are quite a bit to deal with in many respects. We talk, think about religion, but when you get too focused on the rules, you change it to religion. Okay, religion, you're checking off things, making sure you haven't blown it today rather than operating from faith or from love. But 600 is a lot to keep track of, and so they kind of symbolically distilled it down to 10, the 10 commandments. That's pretty simple, right? Well, two days before the Monday, Thursday, we're talking about Tuesday, Jesus was asked in the temple, what's the greatest commandment? He said, the greatest is love the Lord your God. You know that one. He says, the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then he said, on these two hang all the law and the prophets. So Jesus summarized the 600 down to 10, down to two. But on Monday, Thursday, he actually gets it down just to one. Love one another as I have loved you. That's what he is focusing on. Uh, Later on in 1 John, John relays it this way in chapter 3, verse 11. He says, For this is the message you heard from the beginning, we should love one another. It's basic, right? Love, love one another. Now, you would think if love is such an overwhelming um, theme for Jesus, that you would have seen more of it as being an overwhelming cause in church history. I'd like to think I'm... a somewhat proficient in my church history. I read books on it all the time. And the thing is, in all the splits and the wars that have happened in the church over all the years, none of them, to my knowledge, have been over the issue of love. You know, when the Catholics in the West and the Orthodox in the East split in in, uh, 1054, the issue was not love. When Martin Luther nailed the 95 theses on the Wittenberg Castle door to start the Protestant Reformation, the main issue was not love. And in all the different denominational splits since then, it's not because we're splitting so we can be more loving. No. It has to do with some doctrine, some personality, some prophet, some trend or something in society. It's those things. It's not love. And yet Jesus says for the billionth time, love one another. And I know it might kind of sound hokey, pretty stereotypical. But in reality, that is the antidote for the schism that has happened between God and man, which we call sin, to love one another. If you think about the very first sin that was committed, and I'm not talking Adam and Eve, I'm talking before that with Lucifer and his rebellion against God in heaven. And it says in Isaiah chapter 14 that Lucifer looked on up and says, I am going to ascend and be like him. And then it's, her response comes, oh no, I'm going to hurl you down to hell. Wow. The thing is, is that Lucifer, instead of looking up to God with love, he starts looking at the other with envy with jealousy, with covetousness, with rivalry, rather than love. Well, the second sin, okay? Eve is walking through the garden. Satan's there as a snake. He tells her, you want some fruit? Says, no, I'm not supposed to touch it. God says not to touch it. And then he says, you know why God tells you that? Because he's smart and you're not. And all of a sudden she realizes, wait a minute, I'm not as smart as God. Come to think of it, you're right, I'm not. And instead of looking at God as loving God, now he's rival. He has something he's holding out on you. Sin creeps in. We get to the third sin, if you want to call it that, number-wise. Cain and Abel, right? Abel's sacrifice accepted. Cain's wasn't. Instead of Cain saying, Abel, tell me how you do it. I love you. I love God. I want to do better. Inform me. Nah. Abel had something Cain didn't have. He had to die. 
And so it goes on from there. And we live in our times right now in which uh, people villainize. It's us versus them. It's competition. It's rivalry. It's disrespecting. And we need to be able, when we hear that and experience that, to be able to, with our spiritual senses, take a whiff and smell the sulfur on the breath of those who pit one person against another. We look at things like that and we uh, uh, derive that, you know, listen to the words. And every time they have a word with the letter S in it, like gossip, you hear the hiss, gossip, that fork tongue person who's putting the words together that pits person against person because Jesus wants us to love one another as he has loved us. The second thing we come to is Jesus' last bit of advice and that is to remain, abide. That's all through this chapter, especially the first few verses that we read in uh, uh, 9 through 12. Remain, abide, dig in, hang in there. Don't jump ship, dig in. The, uh, we live in a times in which a tendency is to jump ship. Sometimes, some people uh, get in a, are in a company. Then they find out that all the higher-ups are starting to get different jobs. The stock is dropping. They're kind of wondering, man, is this going to go out of business? Do I need to start applying out to other places and so on? Sometimes in relationships, people start to figure, hey, this isn't going to last very long, is it? And the tendency is simply to jump ship, to keep moving, to go somewhere else. And in some places, that's warranted. But Jesus is telling the disciples, don't jump ship with me. Abide, remain, dig in, hang in there, don't give up. You see, it was very soon that Jesus was going to be dead. Well, who's going to hold all these disciples together? In Matthew's account of this same night, in chapter 26 of Matthew, verses 31 through 35, it says this, Then Jesus told them, This very night you will all fall away on account of me. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter replied, Even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. Truly I tell you, Jesus answered, this very night before the rooster crows you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same thing. The disciples, there were fault lines all through their relationships. They were ready to bolt and fall apart. And think about Andrew. He was number four apostle. In reality, he was the first one. He introduced other people to Jesus, and now he was number four. Is that right? He could find something envious or something to envy about that whole situation. James and John want special treatment. The other ten resent them. There's problems there. You got Simon the Zealot versus Matthew the tax collector. They're 180 degrees politically away from each other. It's a shipwreck waiting to happen, and Jesus knows. He's going to get struck. You're all going to scatter. But he's telling, don't run far. Don't run too far away. Abide. Remain. Hang in there. Don't give up. I'll be back. That's what he keeps telling. And it's the same for us to be able to persevere and stick with it rather than jumping ship when tempted to. Back in the 1992 Olympics, there were two epic times I remember to this day that happened. One, uh, uh, 100 meter uh, high hurdles uh, in the women's competition, Gail Devers was running and she was the gold medal favorite. She got to the last hurdle before the finish line, just tripped on it, nose dive, couldn't run any further. She crawled across the finish line. She could have just stopped where she was at, but she had to cross the finish line. That same Olympics, man named Derek Redman was running a race. I don't know exactly the distance, but it was one of the longer ones. But within 100 meters of the, 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 the end line, his hamstring blows. He falls down on the track. Other people run past him. He's finishing last, but he tries to get up and drags his leg towards the finish line. His dad comes out of the stands 
gets up under his arm and helps him hobble across the finish line. Is it okay just to say, hey, I'm not gonna make it, I'm already last place, I'm not gonna bother? Not to them. I don't know if anybody knows who actually got the gold in any of those circumstances, but I remember who got last place because of the style and the determination that they had. And Jesus says the same thing. Hang in there, don't give up. Now, with everything we've been going on through the COVID, there might be some things that you've been ready to pull the plug on. And in reality, there are some things in which, you know, some dead horses just ain't going to budge, right? Understood. But what are some things in which you've been ready to say, I give up? Jesus wants you to know, don't give up him. Don't give up on prayer. Don't give up on reading the scriptures. Don't give up on one another. Don't give up on church. Don't give up on your calling. Don't give up on your ministry. Don't give up on your hope. Hang in there. Abide. Remain. The third thing that Jesus points out is what we call his last stand. Jesus has this great verse. He says, greater love has no one than this, than that he lay down his life for his friends. Lay down his life for his friends. That word lay down is very common with John. If you go back to chapter 10, the pet chapter on the good shepherd, it's many times in that one. For instance, in verse 10 of John 10, verse 11 of John 10, it says this, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Later on in the epistle of 1 John, uh, he uses it quite a bit there, including chapter 3, verse 16. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Lay down. A Greek word that is not spectacular at all. It means to lay down. That's all it means. You got a coat, you lay it down on the chair. You got a newspaper, you lay it on the coffee table. Lay down. It, it does mean down. It doesn't mean you don't lay down something on the top shelf. It means down. But the Lord uses that as a um, contrast. He says, greater love has no one than this. Great is up on the top shelf, right? Greater love has no one than this than to be on the bottom shelf. Again, a contrast. The lowest person, like we said in the communion devotion, about the humblest, the simplest, the lowest down. And that's what Jesus uh, uh, does for us. I remember one of the cutest things and the joy I learned one time about being submissive, about being low down or laid down. One time it dawned on my head. I was seeing somebody else's dog and they're a young dog and I was scratching them behind the ears and it's like a little playful puppy he's trying to kind of bite your hand kind of just out of fun. And then the dog, not being the alpha dog, rolled over on its back for a tummy rub, right? And you just give it the tummy rub and it's all happy. I think it lays down the beauty and the joy of submission, of not trying to be top dog anymore, and that there's joy in that. Our Lord lays down his life for us. It tells us, back to John chapter 10 on the Good Shepherd, that Jesus lays down his life there as well. Do you know where a shepherd lays down? In the doorway of the fold. The fold will be a stone wall, maybe yea, high or so. And there's an opening for a door. Jesus, of course, said he was the door, literally. What does he mean? It means the shepherd lays down in the threshold, in the door. So if there's a predator that comes, the predator has to step over the shepherd. If a sheep wants to get out, he has to step over the shepherd. Jesus inserts himself in between the predator and the sheep. And they're not going to get past him. In many respects, to use a Indiana Jones um, imagery, Indiana Jones starts a ball in motion, right, in the first Indiana Jones movie by trying to steal a certain thing out of a temple and it throws the switch and then he's running with this huge boulder rolling after him. Well, we've talked about this many times. Whenever somebody sins, something somewhere dies. If I sin against you, our relationship dies or hope dies or respect dies, something dies, but no matter what, wherever, whenever you sin, something somewhere dies. Well, another rule that goes on according to justice is that, that uh, um, uh, with every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, right? What goes around comes around, however you want to talk about it. When I trip the trigger of sin, 
a ball starts rolling after Al Brown called the wrath for sin. The soul that sins, it shall die. And so I'm running from that ball, that boulder. All of us are. Why? Because we all sin. And we all have a boulder chasing us. There's only one person on the planet who does not have a boulder chasing them. Jesus, because he never tripped the trigger of sin. But we yell, help, Jesus, help. And what does Jesus do? He pushes us out of the way. And he stands there with the boulder coming straight at him. Because the equation has got to meet out. The soul that sins, it shall die. It has to roll. And he takes the place for you and me. He inserts himself between us and the wrath for our sin. And I am so thankful that my Jesus inserts himself between me and the wrath due to my sin. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, great is your faithfulness to us and awesome is your love. And I pray, Father, you'd help us to be people that do not give up, people that dig in, people that abide, and people that stay in love with you and stay in love with one another. Lord, thank you for the new life you've given us. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Now let's say our benediction together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. God bless.